welcome to Dale Carnegie Training Japan High Impact Presentations. Today we're going to look at the proper use of visuals when we're presenting. Many people ask us at Dale Carnegie about what should I do with uh, preparing my PowerPoint or my keynote presentation? Or what about visuals? What's too much? What's too little? What's the best way to make this work for me? Well, there's a couple of things we need to consider at the very beginning. Firstly, to have impact when you're a presenter, you must have a good structure. It must be something that people can follow. It's very clear as you transition from one section to another of where you're going with this conversation, where you're going with this particular presentation. Naturally, the content must be high quality. There must be clear points with evidence backing up what you're saying. The third one though is really the make or break it. If your delivery is not well rehearsed, well practiced and professional, it doesn't matter how good your structure is, people leave the presentation with a very poor image of your company's brand and your brand. If the structure is good but Content, not very good, not very high quality. Again, you're just killing your brand. But even if your content's great, and even if your structure's great, but you deliver it in such a way that the audience is left bored or they're not relating to it, they're not identifying with the message, then you have had zero impact on that audience. So a big part of the delivery is how we interact with the screen or with handouts that we've got for the audience. So today I'm going to look at what we can do to really improve in that delivery aspect around using visuals. Preparation is the key to everything. Very key question, who is my audience? You have to really understand who you are talking to. What is their level of expertise? What is their level of experience? What's the age range? What's the gender mix? What's their interest in this particular subject? So before we get up in front of any audience, we need to investigate who will be there, what things we think will be most appropriate for that particular audience. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but why are you giving this presentation? What's the purpose? What are you trying to achieve with this presentation? Let me come back to that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Well, how will I open? Critical question. You are competing with what's already inside the heads of every single person in that room. They come to your presentation maxed out. They've got everything that's happening in their lives in their head. What happened that morning, what they've got to do later in the day, things that are going on at work, things that are happening in their personal life. You are really competing with a lot of other stuff. So your opening has got to just carve right through all that distraction and it has to grab their attention so they'll listen to what you have to say. If you don't get that right and you lose them and you've only got a few seconds to grab them, you are going to have a very difficult job to have any impact with that audience. What are some of the key points you're going to make? You've got a certain time limitation. You can't deal with everything. What are the key things I need to be concentrating on? And make sure you've isolated those out and then bracket them throughout the talk so they flow in that structure I talked about before nicely from one to the other. And then again, what are the ideas and evidence that you're going to use to back up those key points? You make a statement. That's great. Okay, I say this. Well, so what? What's the proof? What's the evidence? Who else says that? What are some testimonials? What are some authorities you can draw on to back up what you're saying? And then finally, first impression, I mentioned before, as you open, very critical, grab the audience's attention. Last closing statement. This is the last thing that's going to be ringing in their ears as they walk out of that venue. You must command 
that close. You must have the final key message as the last thing in their minds as they leave you and leave the presentation. And even if you have Q&A from when you sort of finish your presentation until the actual final closing of the uh, particular presentation, you must come back and have a second close. So you might close, go to Q&A, definitely don't end it at the last question in Q&A. Wrap it up. Go back and close it out as you want it to close. You must keep in control of the proceedings. Now, I mentioned a little minute ago about what's the purpose here. There are basically four purposes of our presentations. Either we're trying to convince uh, an audience or impress them about our company or something that we're doing ourselves, or it might be we just want to give them some information to inform them about something, update them on something that's happening. Might be a new regulation, might be a new product release, it could be a new marketing strategy, it could be anything. Or we might be trying to persuade them or persuade them to take some action. Or we might just be there to entertain people. Depending on what you are trying to achieve, then you really need to think, what am I going to present that will help me to achieve that purpose? So don't start with the visuals or, you know, I found this really cool photograph or this really great graph or oh, I've got this really interesting uh, PowerPoint uh, animation. Don't start with the mechanics. Start with the point. What am I setting out to achieve? And then build your opening, build your key points, build your evidence and then build your close around that and then come back and look at the visuals. In fact, I recommend you start with the close. Start with the thing you want to have people remembering. Start with that. Design that first. Then go back and design how you're going to open this up. And then look at, okay, well, what are the key points? And then what is my evidence around those key points? That sounds a bit counterintuitive, but begin where you want to end is not a bad advice. So go back and think about, well, what's the final key message I want to leave with this audience? How am I going to break into their attention that's already crowded with lots of competing ideas and information? How will I arrange my structure so it's logical? And then how will I hang the evidence and the ideas off that? So having done all that and having decided what the purpose is, now let's think about the visuals, what we're going to do. Well, visuals are great. Don't always need to use visuals. And sometimes it's better not to use visuals. Sometimes a PowerPoint-free or a visual-free zone is great when you're doing a presentation. It doesn't have to be a lot of visuals, but they can dramatize ideas. They're also a bit of a guide to the presentation direction. Many years ago, I attended a, a lecture at Harvard Business School. It was an executive course I was on, sent by my company, and the professor gave a three-hour lecture. No notes. It was most impressive. And yet, I did notice at the back of the lecture theater, on a piece of paper, on the back wall, were 10 words. And those 10 words was actually his three-hour lecture. And that was his guide to what comes next. I talk about this, and then I go on to this, and then this comes next. Well, a visual presentation can also be a prompt to us as the speaker as to what comes next. So it keeps us on track with where we're going in our presentation. Visuals can also make the message very easy to understand, particularly if you're talking about numbers, uh, you know, a graph or a pie chart or something like that is a very clear visual signal about a complex idea and helps the audience to understand very, very quickly the message we're trying to get across. And what about the types of uh, visuals that we need to do, uh, need to use, I should say? Well, how many visuals are required? Now, some people have very few, some people have a lot. I once gave a five minute presentation and I used, I think for that one, I used about 90 visuals. Now you might be thinking, 90 visuals in five minutes? Are you nuts? Well, that particular presentation uh, was a warm up to a keynote speaker. We'd sponsored the event and for that we got five minutes. Now, I remember a quote from Abraham Lincoln, you know, I think it's something along the lines he said, if you want me to give a three-hour speech, I can get up and give it right now. 
But if you want a 20 minute speech, it'll take me three or four weeks to prepare it. And that's right. To give a very long speech, a rambling speech, relatively easy, to give a very concise, sharp speech, as I said, five minutes, very tough. Five minutes is a really tough time period in which to speak. Very hard to have impact. So in that particular case, I used 90, but I was using a visual every two seconds. You know, so as I was speaking uh, behind me on a big screen, lots of visuals were just hitting the audience. Because in that five minutes, I needed to uh, get something across about Dale Carnegie Training Japan. Uh, I want to get some visual stimulation because uh, I don't have many words in five minutes to really get in front of that audience with a very strong idea. So I was using that as a technique, but that for that particular case worked very well. Um, generally speaking, I tend to always want to use too many visuals because I'm too greedy and I see all these great things I can show people and I want to show them, but I really have to pare it down. I have to really discipline myself to cut them out. Oh, I really want to use that graph. Oh, that's a great, that's a great visual. No, no, no. Cut it out, cut it out. So try and, and keep it in some sort of range that works for you, depending on what the uh, purpose of your presentation is. A degree of permanency is something you need to think about. It might be better to give it as a handout. It may be something that's just too complex to put up on a screen. And often you get this. I worked in the financial sector for a number of years and had to sit through countless presentations of spreadsheets up on screens with numbers that were so tiny the person standing next to the screen giving you the presentation had no clue uh, as to read it themselves so you know and say crazy things like I know you can't see this but well of course we can't see the thing it's too damn small so get uh, those sorts of visuals in the hands of the audience than rather than trying to see it on screen and the size of the audience uh, a very big audience, visuals may be more important than a very small audience. Um, does it back up the content of what you're saying? How much time have you got to prepare? And where I think a lot of people make a mistake is they put all the time into the PowerPoint or the keynote or whatever it is that they're preparing and no time in the rehearsal. So the whole balance flips and instead of uh, having a case where uh, you get the presentation, structure, content, uh, right, and then spend time on the delivery rehearsal practice, it's all sucked up into the actual visuals pre preparation, which is the wrong balance. So be very cautious about spending all your time on that and not allowing enough time to actually physically stand up and deliver and practice. And finally, the cost, uh, sometimes there might be a cost to uh, buying visuals or, or sourcing visuals that may not be something you want to do. So here's some guidelines for using visuals. As I just mentioned before, sometimes uh, less is definitely best uh, on a screen. Try to avoid paragraphs. Try to avoid sentences if you can. Uh, single words, bullet points, uh, and sometimes bullet points without the point. <laughs> the bullet is sometimes good. Uh, a single word can be very, very powerful. Just one word or even just one number can be very, very powerful. Then you can talk to the number or you can talk to that word. Or just a photograph or a simple visual, and you can talk to the visual. So you don't have to crowd the screen with stuff that we can read ourselves. What you really want is the audience to be focused on you, the presenter, and not on what's on the screen. And this is very critical. So we don't want the screen competing with us. So the less you have up there, the better. Because people look at it, in two seconds they've got it, then they come back to you, which is where you want them. And I mention that uh, two seconds because... I believe that the two-second rule is the key rule. If you are putting something up on screen and an audience cannot see that and understand it within two seconds, it's probably too complicated. Two seconds, that's not long. But if it's more than two seconds, it's probably too complicated. So think about reducing down the volume or breaking it into a couple of parts or maybe just leaving it out and replacing with something you can talk to and don't try and have people work their way through something very complex on a screen. Generally, six by six rule means that, you know, again, less is best. Uh, six words on a line, maybe six lines maximum on a screen uh, is, is good. Again, keeping it very minimalist. You know, six lines or less uh, per visual is probably good and then six words across each line, probably max. And with fonts, try to make fonts that are easy to read. So you might use for the title a 44 
font size and for the text a 32. So it's large font, it's easy to read, particularly on the back of the hall. In font types, uh, sans serif fonts like Arial are very easy to read, where serif fonts like Times, Times Roman, which have got a lot of uh, additional fancy work to them, this can be a bit distracting. So we try and use things like Arial or sans serif fonts to make it easy to read. And uh, again, be very, very, very sparing with all uppercase. It's actually screaming at your audience. It's shouting at your audience when you use strong uppercase like that. You can use it, but use it very, very strategically and very practically, uh, practically to, to make a strong point. So upper and lower case is much balanced. So look for that. Be very careful about using a lot or too much of uh, all uppercase. For visibility, uh, be careful about the overuse of underline, yes, you can use underline, but use it sparingly. Bold, yes, you can use bold, but the same thing occasionally. And italics, yes, very rarely with italics because, again, it's not so easy to read. You can use them, but use them very, very, very modestly. With things like transitions and animations, uh, sometimes good to reveal one concept at a time because there's only one idea on the screen. And then you can talk to that so you're not competing with a lot of words on the screen. And uh, try and keep it consistent and simple. So if you start like that, then maybe continue like that. Or sometimes maybe have it all up on the screen at one time. But try not to have it jumping around too much uh, because then people get very confused. If you're going to have animation where it might be a, a wipe right, for example, as you bring in something, then have it wipe right all the time. Don't have One's wipe right, the next one's wipe up, next one's wipe left, next one's something else. It's very confusing for an audience. And wiping left to right is good because that's how we read. That makes a lot of sense for people. And if we're going to indent on a visual, do it maybe just once on that page. Don't have a sentence or a couple of words and then a whole bunch of indents. Try and, and just keep it. Again, as simple as possible. If you've got that much information, maybe whip that over onto another page. And pictures are great. You know, pictures have a lot of visual appeal. And as we say, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. And a nice, uh, a nice photograph of something that's relevant or a picture, you might have bought the picture or whatever. Nice. And then and people can look at that. Very simply, they get it. Two seconds, they've got it. Now, they're ready for your words to talk about the relevancy of this visual image, this picture, to what uh, your talk is about today. With bar graphs, they're great, uh, easy to compare items, you know, so for certain, particularly uh, measurement related, um, numbers related presentations, you want to compare different variables, bar graphs, very good for that. Line charts, they're great to show change over time. And you can compare two or three items over time, and then it's very easy to see. Oh, this one's up, that one's down, that's flat. Again, very, very simple to understand. And pie charts are fantastic for parts of a whole. You know, what's the share of something? Uh, as long as there's not too many, uh, then a, a pie chart works well as well. With lighting, uh, be very careful when the room gets set up, because honestly, I'm yet to meet very many people who set up rooms who do presenting. The people who get the job to set up the room are rarely presenters themselves. They're just people who are told, you set up the room, put the chairs here, put the lectern there, put the mic there. And particularly the hotels, I'll notice too that a lot of times hotel staff, uh, very unhelpfully, will turn off all the lights on the audience uh, and just have, you know, the whole stage black and then the screen is the main light source. No, no, no. You want the lights on that audience. You want to see your audience. You want to be looking at their faces. What is their reaction to what I'm saying? Am I boring them? Are they with me? Are they nodding? Are they shaking their head? You want to see your audience. So keep the room lights up on the audience. Do not turn it down. Uh, if you can turn it, have to turn it down at all, turn it down very, very little. Try and keep uh, 
the room lit. And uh, around the screen area, it's good if you can actually have the lights off just above the screen because then the screen becomes easier to read. But definitely have the lights on you. You know, when they shut the lights down and you're now in darkness, so you are invisible to an audience, just a voice in the dark. No, have the lights on you, have the spotlights on you so the audience can see your face because your face has got so much power and persuasion. You've got so much credibility through the message, through using your face and using your gestures, your body language. Don't miss that opportunity that the audience can see all of that. And so you might, and although I have to say, I, I'm struggling to think of too many venues where they've managed to isolate out the lights above a screen. But today with most projectors though, the, the screens are pretty good, even with all the lights on. So it's usually not such a big deal. And again, if you design your visuals with that in mind, you're not gonna be too dependent on too much information on a screen. Uh, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. We have a particularly bright room, uh, it might be a lot of natural light. Then often uh, you have a light background with very dark text as a contrast, and that works very well. So the contrast of uh, dark fonts on a light background in a light room can work. Or sometimes in a dark room, you might go the other way and have a, have a, a dark background with light, uh, white and even white bolded text on the screen to really stand out to have the contrast. Colors are tricky. Uh, you rarely see people using them well, I have to say. Colors like black, blue, green, they work very, very well on a screen. They're the best colors. So stay away from oranges and grays and and, and particularly, uh, we'll talk about a minute, red. Uh, so with contrast, black and blue work together well as a contrast, and green and black also work well together as a contrast. So they're, they're good colors to mix and match on the screen. Black and blue, green and black. Red, oh my God, red can be hard to see. In fact, I was at a presentation not that long ago on marketing. It was quite good content and, and reasonably well delivered, but my God, the, uh, the screen, ah, dark blue background, red on dark blue, ooh, could not read it very easily. So red, avoid red, just try and stay away from red. It is hard to read on a screen. And also, don't go crazy and, and try and have some sort of rainbow federation going on here of all the colors we've got and have too many on screen. It's just get too distracting, too confusing. Remember, you are the message. You your voice, your face, your gestures, your body language, your energy, you are the message, not what is on that screen. The screen is a slave to you. It is a servant to you, not the other way around. So when we're preparing, one of the tricky things is we often sit in front of a screen at a, at a very close distance and we're preparing the visuals and then off we go. And now we're in a big room, big venue, big screen, and it somehow it doesn't look like it did when I was preparing it. You go, uh oh, too late. So on your computer, you'll have a presentation mode function. Go to that and then run your slides through that and see how it looks. And also, another handy hint, get to the venue early and run it through their projector on their screen in that venue and then make any final adjustments you need to make there and then because often it is different. And uh, if you are using uh, different computers, for example, at work, I'm using uh, uh, sort of Windows environment. At home, I've got a Mac environment. So when I do things on PowerPoint on my Mac and then I take it to my desktop at work, it looks different. Something in the formatting changes. And often it's a mysterious thing why it changes, but it changes. So be very careful about when you're shifting formats between computers, particularly if you're taking a USB or a, uh, a disk or something and you stick it in the venue's computer and then suddenly, boom, all your formatting's changed and you've got no time to do much about it. So always go early. If you're going to use their computer with your USB or whatever, check. And uh, the, ven the visuals should have some relevancy to what you're presenting. So try and make sure that it's not uh, irrelevant or distracting or competing with the message. So if you have something that's really exciting on the screen, uh, a very, you know, interesting, you get lost. And particularly if you're presenting video, be very careful that 
uh, the video doesn't overrun what you're doing, that the video then takes over the whole presentation and use video sparingly. Uh, it's sad for me to see CEOs of major corporations get up there and they go straight to the video. You know, straight to the video because they don't like presenting or they're not confident or they think somehow the sort of you know corporate video is going to be so riveting for an audience that they're just going to sell the whole message. No, you sell the message. The video is a slave. The video is a servant to you. Use it as an adjunct, not as a uh, as a substitute for you. <laughs> There's no substitute for you, actually. You are the main thing. And uh, electronic backup is good. Uh, not a bad thing to have a second laptop there primed and ready to go because things do go wrong. Have a USB there. Things do go wrong. Have a disk handy. Things do go wrong. Be ready to have some backup if you need it. Uh, recently, I was at a presentation, and this is sort of schadenfreude, you know, uh, for all of us who, who deal with IT, the actual IT guy was doing the part of the presentation and he couldn't get his uh, presentation to work. So now we've got um, a balding pate uh, looking at us because his head's over the keyboard, you know, like under the bonnet of a car trying to fix the, fix the engine. Uh, and here he is. He's got the head down with his bald pate facing us, trying to, you know, get the plumbing to work. On. And it's not a good look, not a good look. And so uh, things do go wrong. Even for IT people who are experts in this area, things go wrong. So don't think it's going to be always perfect. Be ready for trouble. With an audience, there are lots of things we can look at. We can look at the screen behind us. We can look at our, uh, maybe our uh, own screen on our laptop in front of us. We can look at notes, but we should not. We should not be looking much at any of those things. We should be looking at our audience. We should be breaking our audience up into pockets of six. And by that I mean, uh, and I'm an Australian, so I'm not particularly au fait with things like baseball, but I've seen it played. And I've noticed that with baseball, they have like a sort of uh, a curved shape uh, in front of you. So you've got uh, left field, center field, right field. So there's three basic brackets you can break your audience up into. Audience on my left, audience in my center, audience on my right. I also notice they have what they call the inner field and the outer field. So that inner field might be the first few rows of my audience, like the first half of the of the venue, is my inner field, and the back half is my outer field. So now I've got left, right, centre, right, and now I've got front and back. So that creates six pockets. So try and involve the audience in all six pockets. Don't just look at the left side of your audience. Don't just look at the right side of your audience. Don't look at the front row and ignore everyone else. Take your eye contact and involve every single group and look at every single group through the process, the process of your presentation and try and look for about six seconds because less than that, it looks like sort of fake eye contact and too much more than six seconds, it gets a bit intrusive. So six seconds is a good enough period of time to be making a comment while you're looking at an audience member in one pocket and then switch and look to another pocket. And don't do it by numbers like, a, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six in order, you know, left or right. No, no. Break it up. Look randomly. Look all over the place. So you never know quite know where you're going to uh, pick up the next audience group. So it's not predictable. And keep that audience eye contact and glance at your notes, glance at the screen, but keep the main contact with your audience. And so remember, the audience uh, is the key thing. Your monitor of your uh, laptop will, will tell you what's on screen so you can refer to it without having to look backwards at the big screen. Although uh, sometimes for me, I prefer to present without glasses. So uh, if I can, uh, I will sometimes use the big screen to just check what's on there rather than my, my monitor on my laptop because it might be a bit hard for me to see. Can't read it without glasses. So, uh, But I try not to spend too much time looking at that big screen, just glance at it and then talk to my audience. I've seen lots of people uh, get lost with their notes. They've got copious notes and they start reading it. Don't. That's my advice. Don't read it. Do not read it. Have your points. Sure, have some points, have some notes. That's fine. No one will begrudge you looking at some notes to trigger the next phase of what you're going to talk about. But talk about it. You're the expert. Talk to what your topic is about. You've designed it. It's your presentation. You know what the purpose is. Talk to the points. Don't read the points. It just takes away I forget where I was recently. I saw 
someone actually reading the presentation. I mean, they did a reasonable job of reading it, but it would have been so much more impressive if they'd not read it, if they'd actually spoken to it. And uh, you can, you know, you've got points you can talk to, that's enough. So try to avoid looking down and reading. It's not, uh, it's not effective, not going to have impact when you do it that way. Lecterns uh, are a bit of a trap. Uh, again, people who set up venues, they tend to set them up without thinking, so they'll put the lectern there with the sort of stand mic, and uh, if you can, try and use a pin mic rather than a stand mic so you can move around a little bit. Uh, if you can move the lectern, get rid of it. Uh, if the lectern's just a platform to put your laptop on, fine, but move it out of the way, put it to the side so that, yes, you can have the laptop there if you need to look at the screen. Uh, if you're um, not particularly tall, then you should definitely be very careful about being trapped behind a lectern because often uh, the lectern's a bit high. All we can see is your head uh, just framed above the lectern. Again, not a good look. If, if you have to use a lectern, then get the uh, organizers to get you something to stand on so you're going to be high above the lectern. If you can get rid of the lectern, get rid of the lectern because that way we can see your whole body. We've got all the body language available to us. Great for getting messages across. Um, if you've got a mic stand, then take the mic out from the, the mic stand and, and try and move away from the lectern. Even uh, you know if you can't move the lectern, then try and stand in front of the lectern and between the audience and, and the lectern or stand to the side of it if you can. Definitely check out the room. Uh, room layout, very critical. Often people lay out rooms the wrong way. I've been Crazy things happen. I've, I've been to venues where the organizers obviously never give presentations. They set up they set up my position right in front of the projector. Right in front of the projector. I am now going to become the screen. You know, uh, just crazy stuff. So get there early. Uh, if you could actually go the day before, even better. Then you can check out how it's going to look, what's the room like make any adjustments, but certainly a day before is best. If that's not the case, definitely get there early and check it out because crazy stuff happens and people don't know about presenting uh, are often the people given the task of setting it up. Nothing they won't set up correctly. With the room, uh, if you can, always try and stand on the left of the screen. That means the audience left. So we read from left to right. So what we want is the audience is looking at us and then they read what's on the screen. Look at our face, read the screen. Look at us, read the screen. So it often happens that the, the people putting the presentation together, hosting it, will set it up so you're on the right side of the screen. Uh, they'll have the laptop stand there, they'll have the mic set up there. Again, if you can get there early, move it. Say, so, no, can you have that on the other side if possible? If you can't, okay, you have to present from the right side to the audience, but uh, better if you can present to the left side for the audience side. So read left or right, look at you, read, look at you, read is much better if you can organize it like that. And also check uh, where you're standing in terms of audience lines of sight, because sometimes if you're on the same level as the audience and you're standing to the left or to the right, doesn't matter, you might actually be blocking people on the far extremes of the, uh, of the seating. So be careful that you're not standing in front of uh, the screen. Now, sometimes you have a platform uh, and huge screen and you might stand in front of the entire presentation. So you're actually blocking part of the screen. That's okay. Uh, if that's, again, power position is at the center, but then don't stay there. Move, move, walk across stage to the left and talk from there. Come back to the center, move across to the right, then come back to the center. So you're not entirely blocking what's on screen all the time for every slide. And sometimes with the slides, it won't matter. But uh, be careful about not blocking your audience uh, from their seated position to the screen. Microphones, uh, if you have a, a big venue or if you have a really large audience, say more than 30 people, microphones good to use. But if it's a small venue, small audience, you don't need a microphone. It all depends. Sometimes for ladies, they have a soft voice. They can't uh, get the voice to carry. A microphone is definitely recommended. I personally uh, don't use a microphone in a small audience because then it leaves both hands free for gesturing and uh, I'm not restricted. Uh, but if it's a big venue, then yes, I definitely use a microphone. And 
One hit with microphones. If you are nervous, there's nothing worse than seeing a microphone vibrating in your hand through the shaking of your hands. So uh, a good uh, sort of way of, uh, of getting around that problem is grip the microphone with both hands and then hold your hands on your chest. Physically bring both hands, I've got the microphone, and bring both hands to your physical chest and tuck your elbows in. So now the microphone will not sway and vibrate. And show you are nervous. It's not the greatest thing for lack of gestures, but it's much better than the audience fixated on, oh, look at that, that person's totally nervous. Look at that vibrating microphone. Wow, they look really scared. No, don't have that. If you've got the calmness to hold it in one hand, great. Swap hands so you can use both hands for gesturing. And don't hold it right up to your mouth. Now, this is sometimes funny with uh, things like the um, Academy Awards. You know, you see so-called professionals. Uh, they've got the stand mic on the dais, on the lectern, and they'll lean down. They'll actually physically lean down. So they're leaning right over to speak into this little mic. Microphones are so sophisticated today. They catch the sound. You don't have to lean down. You should be talking across the top of the microphone, not jamming it up in front of your mouth. Hold it away from you and speak across the top. You will catch it just fine. With the projector, sometimes you don't need to have things on screen and just hit B. Go to your laptop or uh, your, your keyboard, hit B, and then the whole screen will go black and there's nothing to distract an audience and they just got to listen to you and look at you and you come back, just hit the space bar and the screen will come back on again. Uh, if you want to go to an all white, uh, you can just hit, I think all white is W from memory and that'll give you an all white screen if you want an all white screen for some reason, it might be a dark room hit uh, W for all white and up it comes, but B for all black, just black it out, which is, again, cuts down the distractions. Be careful about waving your hands around with the screen behind you, uh, because then we start looking like shadow puppets, you know, and people get distracted by the shadow of your hand on the screen. So be careful about that. That's something you don't want to have happening. Be careful about positioning of your hand relative to a screen. With uh, things in your hand, don't hold notes in your hand. You know, it's amazing. When we're teaching people how to give presentations, we'll sometimes have uh, people wanting to hold the actual document they've prepared in their hand, but they never look at it. You know, they <laughs> they don't need it. I say, leave it on your desk or leave it somewhere close. You can look at the notes, but don't hold it in your hand. But if you do have a, an exhibit or something that you want to show the audience, that's great. Pick it up, then use it, then put it down again. So you don't have to hold it the whole time. Uh, don't have things in your pockets. Uh, you might have something in your pocket. You want to bring it out, show the audience because you're hiding it. Then just put it away uh, so it's not distracting. And uh, one thing, though, is with the, the, the clickers, the slide clickers, uh, you know, they can also be a distraction. But and again, you've, you've got them there. You've got to use them. Visuals can be a distraction from your message. Make sure they're relevant. Make sure they are not overpowering you, uh, particularly on the big screen. Make sure that the audience is looking at you, not totally as what's on the screen. So design it so they've got two seconds, they can get it, then they come back to you. Power is also a tricky thing. You know, the uh, power supply can go down. This can happen. Suddenly you lose uh, the screen, you lose, you know, lights, You might, depending on the, the venue. Soldier on. Uh, you might have your laptop not connected to the power supply, and then your laptop battery dies. Uh, check all these things so that you're on track to have power. If you lose power, charge on, keep going. Don't worry about it, unless you have to evacuate the, uh, the building for some reason, but keep going. If power fails, uh, be prepared. Be prepared to keep going. Have, have notes or have it in your mind what you want to talk about. Be prepared to wrap it up. Don't look stuck. Don't look lost. Keep going. Test everything before you start presenting, of course. Now, this mysteriously happens. I was at a presentation recently. I got there early, fortunately. I uh, went through. I checked my visuals. It was all working. And then suddenly, suddenly, the visuals were not working could not get the computer to work. I do not know to this day what was wrong, but I had to get out, reboot it, reset it, 
you know, go through the whole process. It takes time. Test everything, test everything, test everything, and give yourself time margin. And fortunately, in that particular case, with about two minutes to spare, I got it up again and, and we were away. I could have presented without the visuals. It wasn't a big deal. I could have done it without the visuals, but it would have been, you know, a little bit more powerful with the visuals to give some, you know, extra buzz to what I was talking about. But these things happen, so check, 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 check. With the remote, sometimes uh, the remotes are useful, uh, clicking through. I'm a bit of a love-hate thing with visual remotes because it's in my hand. So I try to hold it in my hand in a way that it's not obvious that I've got it. Uh, so I still try and use that hand for gesturing. Uh, I'll try and put it down if I don't need it. With laser pointers, though, oh my god, laser pointers. Some people go nuts with the laser pointer. You know, the worst thing is they point the laser at the audience. I've seen that. You know, let's uh, let's zap a few eyeballs here with our laser beam. Uh, no, don't do that. Or they're whizzing the thing around uh, all over the place, like they've forgotten that the the laser's on. And so the lasers, you know, doing some sort of laser show in the venue because they're waving their arms around with the laser still on. No. Or they try to use the laser beam to indicate something on the screen. They're, they're whipping it around at a very rapid pace all over the place. No, we can't understand that. If you're going to use the laser, go to the word or the, the section and use the beam slowly. Move it very slowly. If you're going to circle something or across something that you want to underline, very, very slow is the key. This stuff focus is important. I said before with the eye power, uh, if it's at a big venue and the screen takes up the whole background, uh, again, I like to use the front, uh, left, right side uh, for a bit of variation. And I try to stand as far to the front of the apron of the venue as I can and try not to fall into the audience. I've come close to that a few times <laughs> by getting a bit too close. But it's good. It's good to be very close because then you're physically co close to your audience and you can have more impact, more body language power when you're up close. That's always a good position to be in. And sometimes you'll have something on screen. Use your arms to reach back to what's on screen, but keep looking at your audience. So your arm actually indicates where you want your audience to look. That's very good. So they see, oh, OK, I need to look at the screen now. I need to look at this part of the screen now. And Use that gesture very effectively to make focus. And again, use it for focus. Don't use it all the time, just to direct their attention to particular things. And again, uh, tell people uh, where you're going with your presentation. Uh, set it up so people are aware of what's coming also. Now we're going to talk about so-and-so. So they, the next screen comes up, they know what to expect rather than being surprised all the time about what's coming up. So this keeps them focused. And, and your bridges or your transitions in your talk between your key points, you bring them visually into the next section of your talk works very well. And I said before about keeping the lights on. Worst thing in the world is you are in light, audience is in darkness, and you can't see. Now, uh, I work in Japan, live in Japan, and I've noticed that uh, Japanese audiences, uh, if you turn the lights out, they're very, very quick to lose focus, I think. I think it's probably true around the world, but uh, because I do a lot of presenting here, I'm probably noticing it more in Japan, but uh, don't turn the lights off the audience. Keep the lights on the audience and allow yourself to read the reaction to your voice and what you're saying. Look at their faces. How many are nodding? How many are just looking dead bored? How many are now on their iPhone checking email because you've lost them? need to be able to see them to keep the focus on your audience to then switch gears. Now, if you need to get your audience back in the room, ask a question, a rhetorical question. Uh, they don't know, though, whether it's a rhetorical question or a real question, but by asking a question, you get their attention back in the room. They'll come back from wherever they are, and you've got them again, and then keep going. Uh, the way we present uh, conversational language is very good. Storytelling, very good. We all relate to storytelling. Uh, it takes us into uh, the context, the why of what you're talking about very quickly. Um, congruency between what you're presenting and how you're presenting it is very important. 
Uh, remember, I can't remember the comedian. This is going back it's 50 years ago now, 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. I remember I, I heard a, uh, some American comedian and he was talking about he was the, a graduate of the so-and-so um, school of speed reading. But he spoke in this really slow voice, you know. My name is, I am a graduate of the so-and-so school of speed reading. He's speaking like this as a graduate of the school of speed reading. So it was for a joke, it was comedy. But there's no congruency, you see, because um, he's not matching the way of delivering the words with the message. So same thing, if it's a very... A serious point, then you shouldn't be laughing. You shouldn't be smiling. You should look serious. If it's a lighthearted point, if it's something that's good news, don't look unhappy. Don't look serious. Look happy. So uh, we need to make sure that the content is matched by the delivery. And the speed is something that we use for variation in our voice, speeding things up, slowing them down for emphasis, putting the power in taking the power out. These are all controls we can use for variation. So we have modulation in our voice where we're going up and down as well, uh, which gives us power, it gives us variation. We can have gestures and about 15 seconds is max that you'd want to hold a gesture because after that, the power of the gesture is dead and it just becomes annoying. So you turn the gestures on, turn them off. Uh, using our face, as I said before, for highlighting, like if you're something surprising, show a surprise face. If it's a very uh, great piece of news, show a really happy face, you know. If it's something that's very serious, show a serious face. So the, the voice or the face or the body language, everything matches up with the key message. And body language too, uh, using the, the energy uh, in Japanese, we talk about the ki, like in Aikido, no ki, the ki of Aikido. Uh, this The energy, the power we have inside us by projecting that power energy out to the audience. You give the audience energy, give them power, you bring their energy level up, they're more receptive to your message. So if your energy levels start dropping through the process of giving a presentation, you'll notice that your audience level will start to drop too, and they'll start to get distracted. So be prepared to keep your energy levels high, but don't have it maximum high all the time. That just wears an audience out, wear you out too, by the way. So you need to have some variation, very strong, and then sometimes very, very soft, and, and drop it down. Remember to have that drop in the voice. Sometimes a whisper. I remember once I, I gave a presentation. It was in Kobe. It was at a university. It was for uh, summer school students who had graduated were going back to their home countries. And I was giving this uh, very uplifting talk about how they could use the experience they had in Japan uh, back in their home country. And it was very powerful. It was a very, very powerful presentation I gave. And then the speaker after me was actually a Korean professor. And he was the opposite. And maybe because of the way I presented, I don't know, but he spoke very quietly. He spoke in a very soft voice throughout the whole presentation. And it really forced you to lean in and listen to him because you had to really really work a little bit hard to listen to him. So he got people's attention by having a softer voice. And I thought at the time, oh, wow, look at that. That was very effective. And I, I realized, ah, just, just being one power all the time is not going to work. I need to have variety in my voice. And so I should have times when it's very powerful and other times when it's very soft. So... Just watch yourself that you're not getting into either too much soft or too much strong. Variety is the key. Uh, as I said before, gestures are very, very important. Uh, be careful about getting your hands tied up with things. Uh, if you're saying, you know, the one thing, you hold up the finger, one or two things, hold up two fingers. And if you're holding things up like that, hold it up around about head height. Don't hold gestures around about your waist height. It's too low. People struggle to see it. Get your gestures up in that band. Around about chest, from chest height up to about top of your head height, that zone is the key height that you want for showing gestures. Uh, you want to show a big point, open your hands right out. Don't be afraid of big gestures. Uh, use, use gestures uh, that are congruent. Be careful about waving your fist at people in your audience. It looks aggressive. It looks combative. Use the open hand rather than a, a closed fist. And don't hit your hands together. Slap them together or slap them on your thigh. That becomes distracting. Uh, just use the gestures by themselves. As I said before, 15 seconds is probably at the max you want. And you can walk around on the stage, but be careful about walking around too much, pacing up and down. That makes you look a bit nervous. Uh, try and hold the main point and move because you've got a reason to move. Again, uh, names of people in your audience is a great thing to use. You know, if you can get there early, 
meet some of your audience, have a conversation with someone. It's nice. It's nice in the presentation to refer to that person and say, "I was just chatting with uh, with uh, Jim, Jim Jones over there before, and uh, he made a very interesting point about giving presentations." In fact, Mary made uh, an addition to that point. Uh, Mary Smith made an addition to that point. Blah, blah blah. Suddenly, you've got both people very much proud and involved. You know, they've been recognised by the speaker. The audience now feels that you have a stronger connection with the audience. Uh, just simple things like this, refer to people by name, very, 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 very effective. And so uh, try and look for those opportunities to engage with your audience. I said before about what's the point of the uh, presentation, who's your audience, what's the point, and then being conversational and customizing the delivery to your listeners have uh, exhibits or have demonstrations of things or evidence or whatever that's custom made to match that audience or match the point that you're making. Don't just bring out a set off the shelf pack for a presentation. You might have the basis of a presentation, but think about who am I talking to, what is my key point, and then take it and rework it, repackage it up. I, you know, I've given now I'm close, very close now to about 500 presentations uh, here in the last uh, 20 plus years in Japan. And I have never given the same presentation twice, ever. Even with the slides, I will always uh, have some small, you know, small variation, but certainly the way I present it will be different every time. Keeps it fresh for me as a speaker, and it also keeps it fresh for an audience, because if I feel stimulated, interested in what I'm talking about, the chances are that that's how the audience will receive it too, and they'll feel stimulated in this as well. So do not receive a pack either. I mean, often, you know, the, you'll see it. The, the president's had uh, some munchkins uh, out the back preparing his presentation for him or her, and often it'll be the first time that they've even seen the presentation, and it's obvious that it's the first time they've seen the presentation, and they really don't know what's coming next, and they struggle through it, and it's really killing the brand. I mean, it's killing the brand, the organization is killing the president's or the presenter's personal brand. You don't want that. Get it, customize it, make it yours, and then present it. So there we have some ideas on how to present your visuals when you're giving your presentations, which is based on our training called High Impact Presentations, where we teach people over two days how to become a high impact presenter and how to learn a number of different structures really cover off all the major structures you need for an audience, how to isolate out the content you want, how to deliver it, how to do things like uh, Q&A very effectively, uh, how to deal with pressure, really intense pressure situations, how to present complex information, how to be persuasive, how to inspire people to take action, how to create a great first impression. There's a whole raft of things in that two-day course, it's really the Rolls-Royce of presentation skills. I mean, this is where Dale Kenny started in 1912, uh, teaching people how to be persuasive. And uh, if ever you have a chance after listening to this, uh, to do that particular course, and you haven't done it before, grab that opportunity because it is a powerhouse course. It is a game changer of a, of a training course. And uh, two days, everything, everything is videoed. You have two trainers, uh, so you have coaching while watching yourself on screen. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal course. And I, I take it myself and I strongly recommend it. So uh, best, of, uh, best of luck. And remember, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Do not be consumed by the construction of the materials. They are secondary to you. But when you do construct your materials, take advice. What I've given you today, re look at what we've talked about. Use those ideas, use those hints, and you will give a much, much better presentation. Good luck, and I hope that we can see you one day in a high-impact presentations class for Dale Carnegie somewhere in the 90-plus countries and the 30-plus languages we deliver around the world. Thank you for your attention.